This is a summary of J.L. Mackey's essay, Evil and Omnipotence. And this is his treatment of the problem of evil. He frames it as a logical problem, meaning there are three statements that are logically inconsistent, meaning they can't all be true at the same time. These are the three statements. Number one, God is omnipotent. Number two, God is wholly good. And number three, evil exists. If God is omnipotent and wholly good, he thinks evil shouldn't exist. And so he, so hence the contradiction. He considers several possible strategies of getting out of it. He thinks that you can avoid the problem if you invoke one of these solutions. He calls them adequate solutions. Number one, well, you can, the first three are just denying the three statements above. God is omnipotent, good, and that evil exists. If you just deny any one of those, you don't have a logical problem. Number four is putting limits on omnipotence. So you could redefine omnipotence in such a way that uh, makes it possible for, for God and evil to coexist. So the, the traditional view of omnipotence he's dealing with, I shouldn't say the traditional view, I should say the popular view that he's dealing with is that omnipotence means the ability to do anything whatsoever. Now, the theological view that um, he's gonna talk about briefly is that's been held through the centuries, at least in Christianity, is that omnipotence means the ability to do anything that doesn't result in a contradiction. It isn't a contradiction in itself. So one more thing, number five, uh, we could get out of the logical problem if we explain how evil can coexist with good. Next, he considers some fallacious solutions. And I've organized this handout uh, to list off each one of these solutions, one through four. And you can see, uh, uh, he, he writes very clearly in the essay. Uh, he, he deals with, he, he responds to the solution. He considers a possible rejoinder to his own response. And then he often replies to that rejoinder. And what I've done here is, is, is organize it as a sort of outline. So you can clearly see the logical flow. So the first solution to the first fallacious solution to the problem of evil is that good cannot exist without evil. In other words, you've got to have evil if you want good. But Mackey's response to this is that this limits omnipotence. He, he thinks, why, if, if God is omnipotent, can't an omnipotent being do anything? Can't an omnipotent being create good without evil? He considers a possible rejoinder here, quote, these limits are always presupposed omnipotence has never meant the power to do what is logically impossible. But he replies to this that, yeah, but many theists uh, these days actually do believe that omnipotent means the ability to do anything whatsoever. They're, it's not qualified in this way. And again, it sounds like he's got in mind this sort of popular theism, not the traditional theological views held in the West about God's omnipotence. That said, what's his target? If his target is theism or theological, the traditional theism, then he's going to miss it if he's focused on this other type of popular theism defining omnipotence in this way. So that's just something to keep in mind. We hope that he has that in mind as well as he's writing this. Mackey's second response is that this solution denies the assumption that good is opposed to evil. One of the assumptions of the logical problem of evil is that good is opposed to evil, that good would try to reduce or eliminate evil wherever possible. A possible rejoinder to this is that good and evil are relative terms like great and small, but he thinks that theists don't actually think of it that way. They think that goodness is an intrinsic or intrinsic term. It's not a relative term. When they talk about goodness in terms of God, it's not, it's not something that's relative to others. God isn't just better than other things he is. He is the best. He is, he is intrinsically good. A possible rejoinder to this, he considers, is that good and evil are necessary counterparts, like redness and non-redness. Mackey's first reply to this is that good and evil aren't, quote, genuine logical opposites. In other words, you can have good without evil as you can have red without non-redness. I think he's right on this, at least to a certain extent. He thinks that you can have a world that's completely red, like God created a world that was completely red. Um, we wouldn't know it. We wouldn't know what red was in a world like that, but it's, he thinks it's possible. And I think it's possible too, as long as there's at least, we hold out for this conception of non-redness that exists alongside it. If it helps, you can think of it in the mind of God or in some objective sense, there is some 
uh, idea of non-redness that exists, even if it's if we don't have access to it. So, anyways, that's a side point there. But Amaki's second reply is that even if they are opposites, good and evil, or red and non-redness, only a speck of evil needs to exist to be a sufficient counterpart for good. In other words, there's too much of it. So this is still a logical problem for the theist. And I think he's 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 partly right here. I think he. He doesn't even need to have a speck of evil here. He could just, again, leave e evil as an idea alone, and that might be uh, enough for him in this case. Moving on, solution number two. Evil is necessary as a means to good. Mackey's response to this is that this limits God too. This, this seems to restrict God by causal laws uh, when God seems to be should be the author of, the, of these laws, at least lots of theists believe that he, he is. Again, uh, this might be a, a very popular view of theism, not necessarily the traditional view, which might ground these laws in God's nature or something else. This is connected to solution number three, which is the following. The universe is better with some evil in it than it could be if there were no evil. And the solution, um, the solution is similar to number two, and what the person who's, who uses this solution has in mind is that you've got uh, a realm of first order goods like pleasure, and included in there are first order evils like pain, but you might think that there are such things as second order goods like compassion or forgiveness, but these would depend on there being first order evils like pain and suffering. So in that way, second order goods are only attainable in a world where there are first order evils. So evils are required. Mackey's response to this is why not collapse second order goods into first order goods? Let's just say they're all about happiness and pleasure and that's it. Okay, maybe you could do that, but you've got to ask yourself, is such a move plausible? Does it make sense of your experience that all goods are just forms of pleasure. Consider again, forgiveness and compassion, which seem to be dependent upon on certain bad things happening, right? Wrongdoing or, or suffering. Mackey's second response is that this seems to make God only concerned to maximize good, not minimize evil. Is this a problem? Again, I'll ask you, you can decide this on your own. On this view, it seems like God is using evil and purposely using evil to bring about a better world is this a problem? You decide. Next, Mackey's third response is that the existence of second order goods entail the existence of second order evils. So we've just introduced second order goods like compassion and forgiveness, but now we've got to consider that it might be second order evils like cruelty. But if we do that, we might uncover some third order goods, fourth order goods ad infinitum, and he thinks such an infinite regress would be unacceptable. Well, let's consider the last one, number four, evil is due to human free will. This is the popular free will defense. It's the most common response I hear from students about the problem of evil. It says that humans are responsible for the evil in the world and God created us free and as such can't prevent us from choosing evil. Mackey's first response to this is a bit strange. He says, quote, why could he not have made men such that they always freely choose the good? Now you gotta think about this carefully. And I'll repeat it. Why could he not have made men such that they always freely choose the good? I don't know about you, but that just seems meaningless to me. It seems like nonsense. How can someone make someone do something freely? Okay, but he's aware of this. He, his, his rejoinder is that this idea is absurd, but his reply to the rejoinder is that then freedom must mean a randomness, which is itself absurd. So if we make choices, he says, we must make it based on our characters, which on theism must come from God. God created our characters, and that's why we choose the things we do. But that, um, again, make, means that we're not necessarily, uh, it, that means God's implicated in the choices that we make, and God could have made us differently. Mackey's second response is that, quote, if men's wills are really free, this must mean that even God cannot control them. That is that God is no longer omnipotent. He considers a possible rejoinder to this, which says God is omnipotent still, but just refrains from intervening. 
But Mackey's reply to this is, if a good God doesn't intervene, then evil must not be really evil after all. God would want to get rid of it if it were really evil. But apparently God's refraining from doing that because he's going to bring about a, a greater good. But then that evil must not be evil at all, must be good. And so that doesn't apply to this logical problem. That brings about the paradox of omnipotence. At the end of the, the essay, he asks, can an omnipotent being make things which he cannot subsequently control? If you answer yes to this, then he isn't omnipotent. If you answer no to this, then he isn't omnipotent, hence the paradox. He talks about uh, first order omnipotence versus the second order omnipotence. The first order omnipotence is, quote, the unlimited power to act. And so for many people, God would have that kind of omnipotence. The second order omnipotence is um, the unlimited power to determine what powers to act things shall have. And so this would be like giving over or refraining from acting. This would be giving over power to creatures to do what they want and basically tying his own hands. He doesn't think that's a plausible way of conceiving of God. He's got another a paradox called the paradox of sovereignty that he tries to show how this isn't this doesn't follow or this doesn't make much sense especially when it comes to to god um, but i'll let you read that uh, in concluding thoughts i just wanted to mention that mackey does get a very careful treatment in this book by alvin planiga god freedom and evil where uh, planiga tries or does show that you that that god cannot create a world where uh free creatures always choose the right thing, always choose the good thing. And Mackey's essay was written in originally 1954. This one was written in 1973. Um, both are very famous. So I'd recommend them to you. I uh, hope that was helpful.